Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the bank as we present our Monetary Policy Committee statement. Our discussions were Start again. Good afternoon, everyone. Most welcome to the Central Bank as we discuss and present our monetary policy statement. Our discussions were rigorous and thorough with presentations that were well researched and thoughtful, and our thanks go to the team that were working on this. Since the previous meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee, the intensity of the financial crisis in the Eurozone appears to have subsided somewhat, but the very mixed signals that indicate the crisis is not necessarily resolved prevail. Despite the positive indications, the global outlook remains fragile amid doubts about the strength of the U.S. recovery, a recession in Europe, the extent of the slowdown in China, and higher international oil prices. Domestic economic growth remains constrained, but the performance of the economy in the fourth quarter of 2011 and some positive developments in the global economy indicate a slightly better outlook than previously expected. The most recent inflation outcome surprised on the downside, and there has been a slight downward revision to the inflation forecast, while inflation expectations continue to be anchored around the upper end of the inflation target band. Inflation appears to be somewhat more broad-based, but in line with our previous forecasts, and the risks to the outlook remain evenly balanced. The year-on-year -year inflation rate as measured by the Consumer Price Index for all urban areas was 6.1% in February, down from 6.3% in January. This favorable outcome was primarily the result of a moderation in food price inflation from 10.7% to 10.1%. The categories of food, housing and utilities, and transport together accounted for 4.2 percentage points of the inflation outcome. CPI, inflation excluding food, petrol and electricity, increased from 3.9% in December to 4.3% in both January and February, remaining unchanged. Year-on-year -year producer price inflation has continued its moderating trend, measuring 8.9% and 8.3% in January and February 2012, respectively. Agricultural price inflation declined from 7.9% in January to 4.6% in February, while manufactured food price inflation remained unchanged at 10.9%. The inflation forecast of the bank is marginally lower at, than at the time of the previous MPC meeting. Inflation is still expected to peak in the second quarter of 2012, but at a slightly lower rate of 6.5%, and to average 6.1% in the final quarter of 2012, and 5.6% in the subsequent quarter. Inflation is expected to measure 5.2% by the end of the forecast period at the end of 2013. The slightly improved inflation trajectory is mainly a result of, less of a less depreciated exchange rate assumption. Following the change in the electricity tra tariffs by NERSA, the electricity price assumption has been reduced from 17.3% to 12%. However, given the low weight of electricity in the CPI basket, the impact on the forecast was marginal. The forecast for core inflation as measured by headline inflation excluding food, electricity, and petrol, continues to show an upward trend, reflecting possibly more broad-based inflation pressures as well as base effects. This measure is expected to peak at an average of 5.4% in the final quarter of 2012, which is marginally lower than, the than in the previous forecast. Inflation expectations, as reflected in the survey of inflation <coughs> expectations conducted by the Bureau of Economic Research, at Stellenbosch University during the first quarter of 2012 appear to have remained relatively anchored around the upper end of the inflation target range. Respondents expect inflation to average 6.1% in both 2012 and 2013 and 6% in 2014. Compared with the previous survey, the forecast for 2012 is unchanged, while that for 2013 is up by 0.1 percentage point. Business executives are the most pessimistic with expectations of 6.5% for both 2013 and 2014. The expectations of financial analysts are marginally higher than those reflected in the latest Reuters survey of market analysts, which shows expect expected inflation to average 6.2% in 2012 and 5.7% in the following two years.
The immediate threat to the global economy posed by the European sovereign debt crisis appears to have subsided somewhat, but significant risks remain. Market signals in respect of what progress is being made with the resolution of the crisis are mixed, but spreads on sovereign debt of the affected European economies have narrowed significantly, partly as a result of the Greek debt swap, as well as liquidity provision by the ECB, which has been directed in part to increase purchases of sovereign debt by banks. Despite these positive developments, the Eurozone economy is still expected to experience a recession this year in the face of widespread fiscal austerity and tight bank lending conditions. Continued deleveraging by banks is also a considerable risk given potential spillover effects. The U.S. economy shows signs of improvement, but the economy still has a negative output gap, and there are still some doubts about the sustainability of their growth performance. The Chinese economy has shown signs of slowing, but a hard landing is not widely expected. Emerging market growth generally is also more subdued, and the policy tightening that had been a feature of many of these countries earlier in 2011 has either stopped or been reversed. Global inflation appears to be broadly contained and slowing growth and declining food amid slowing growth and declining food to price trends. However, international oil price developments driven mainly by geopolitical factors, are posing an increasing risk not only to inflation, but also to the growth outlook. Since the previous meeting of the MPC, the RAND has appreciated in line with declining risk aversion in global financial markets. The volatility of the RAND has also moderated, with the RAND fluctuating in a range of between 7 Rand 45 and 7 Rand 78 to the US dollar since the beginning of February. Since the beginning of the year, the RAND has appreciated by 5% against the dollar, by 2.3% against the euro, and by 4.8% on a trade-weighted basis. The Reuters poll in February reflects an expectation that the RAND will continue to trade at around current levels for the rest of the year. However, the currency is expected to remain sensitive to changes in global investor sentiment. The pattern of portfolio flows to South Africa has persisted, with non-residents being net buyers of bonds and net sellers of equities, despite a resumption of net flows into emerging equity markets in general. Since the beginning of the year, non-resident net purchases of bonds have totaled 17.5 billion rand, while net sales of equities have totaled, have totaled 6 billion rand. The domestic economic outlook appears slightly more favorable against the backdrop of a more positive global outlook. In 2011, an annual real growth rate of 3.1% was recorded, following a fourth quarter growth rate of 3.2%. The latter was driven mainly by positive contributions from the manufacturing and mining sectors, partly reflecting some normalization following the impact on the third quarter growth performance of industrial action and other disruptions. The bank's growth forecast has been revised marginally upwards, with real GDP expected to increase by 3% in 2012, compared with 2.8% in the previous forecast, mainly as a result of a slightly more favorable global outlook, which itself remains uncertain. The growth forecast for 2013 has increased from 3.8% to 3.9%. This moderately improved outlook is consistent with the increases in the RMBBR Business Confidence Index in the first quarter of 2012 to above the, level of, uh, to above the neutral level of 50 as well as the positive trend observed in the South African Reserve Bank's composite leading, composite leading indicator. Nevertheless, the expected growth rates remain disappointing and still imply a persistence of the negative output gap. Notwithstanding the improved forecast, the outlook for the mining sector continues to disappoint, with an annualized growth rate of 0.7% in the final quarter of last year. In January 2012, mining output contracted at a month-on-month -month rate of 4.6%, and output in February is expected to have been negatively impacted by industrial action, maintenance shutdowns, and electricity supply constraints. More positively, the recovery in the manufacturing sector is expected to continue. The physical volume of manufacturing output increased by 1.2% on a month-on-month -month basis in January, while the Cajiso BER Purchasing Managers Index increased significantly from 53.2 index points in January to 57.9 index points in February, its highest level since February 2010. Nevertheless, the sector is still characterized by excess capacity, which is likely to constrain investment in the sector. Trends in gross fixed capital formation are also encouraging, 
with an annualized growth rate of 7.2% in the fourth quarter of 2011 and 4.4% for the year. Nevertheless, the ratio of gross fixed capital formation to GDP at 18.9% is still significant below the peak of 24.6% reached in the final quarter of 2008. The renewed focus by government on infrastructure spending, expenditure and successful implementation should underpin fixed capital formation and also give a boost to the domestic construction sector, which remains under pressure. There are concerns, however, that continued underspending on infrastructure by provincial and local governments, as well as possible electricity supply constraints, could retard these developments. Formal sector employment growth was relatively low in the fourth quarter of 2011. According to the quarterly employment statistics, the QES of Stats South Africa, Formal sector employment grew at a quarter-on-quarter -quarter rate of 0.3%, but on a seasonally adjusted basis, the growth was in fact slightly negative, and by 1.6% over four quarters, amounting to 130,000 employees. Formal sector employment will have to grow by a further 131,000 to reach the levels achieved in 2008 before the crisis. Household consumption expenditure remained robust in the final quarter of 2011, when it grew at an annualized rate of 4.6%, compared with 3.8% in the previous quarter, and by 5% for the year. This category was the largest contributor to GDP growth in 2011. The increased pace of spending, particularly on durable goods, was consistent with a further increase in disposable income of households, positive wealth effects, and a low interest rate environment. At these growth rates, consumption is not expected to pose a significant risk to inflation, and there are some indications that consumption expenditure growth may have peaked following the 0.6% contraction in retail sales growth in January and a moderation in new vehicle sales growth in February. The FNBBR Consumer Confidence Index also remained unchanged at a relatively neutral level in the first quarter of 2012. There has been a gradual increase in the growth of credit extension in recent months, reflecting in part the increase in consumption expenditure. Having fluctuated around 6% for much of 2011, 12-month growth in total loans and advances to the private sector increased to 7.4% in December 2011 and 7.3% in January 2012. Growth in mortgage advances has remained subdued at 2.4% in January, with the main driver coming from the category of other loans and advances. All the components of this category showed strong 12-month growth in January. Credit card in advances increased by 11.1%, a three-and-a-half-year high. Bank overdrafts by 14.5%, having experienced negative growth between January 2009 and March 2011. And general loans, which moderated slightly to 15.5% in January from 17.6% in December. This latter category is mainly made up of unsecured lending, where loans to households continue to grow at rates of around 30%. While this is still a relatively small proportion of total loans and advances, it appears to be an increasingly important source of funding for consumer credit. At this stage, it is not translating into excessive consumption expenditure, but this trend towards unsecured lending is being carefully examined to ensure we have a better understanding of what constitutes this lending. Despite the resulting higher household indebtedness, the ratio of household debt to disposable income declined further to 74.6% in the final quarter of 2011, compared with a peak of 82.7% in the first quarter of 2008. The household debt service costs to disposable income are at levels well below their long-term average. The recent national government budget tabled before Parliament indicates a moderately tighter fiscal policy stance compared with that in the October 2011 medium-term budget policy statement and the commitment to the medium-term fiscal consolidation remains. The fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP is now budgeted to be 4.6% in the 2012-13 fiscal year, compared with 5.2% in the medium-term budget policy statement, and to decline to 3% by 2014-15. The government gross debt-GDP ratio is expected to peak at 42.4% in 2014-15, and the net debt GDP ratio at 38.5%, which is much lower than the international benchmark for debt sustainability of around 60%. Cost push pressures remain the main drivers of inflation. 
but there have been some favorable developments with respect to administered prices. NOSA accepted Eskom's proposal for an average electricity tariff increase of 16% for the 12 months beginning of the 1st of April, compared with the previously approved increase of 25.9%. The guidelines for municipal tariff increases is 11.3%, compared with 16.6% previously. Nevertheless, nearly all administered price increases remain in excess of, up, of the upper end of the target range, apart from communication and television licenses. Wage settlements remain on average in excess of inflation. According to Andrew Levy Employment Publications, the average wage settlement rate in collective bargaining agreements declined to 7.7% in 2011. Growth in nominal remuneration per worker declined from 8.8% in the year to the third quarter of 2011 to 6% in the fourth quarter. Unit labor costs declined from 8.4% to 5% over this period. Oil prices remain a risk to the outlook and have increased by around $15 US dollars a barrel since the previous meeting, mainly as a result of increased geopolitical risk. While an escalation of these risks could cause further upward pressure on oil prices, upward pressures, oil price increases are likely to be constrained by the fact that higher oil prices could derail the global recovery and therefore reduce demand. Domestic petrol prices have been impacted by these global developments. In the past two months, petrol prices have increased by 62 cents per litre, but would have been significantly higher were it not for the more appreciated exchange rate. A further sizable increase is expected in April, which will include a 28 cent per litre increase in the fuel levy. Food prices remain an important determinant of inflation, and as noted earlier, were the main contributors to the downward movement of CPI inflation in March. Some further moderation, partly a result of base effects, may be expected over the coming months. Global food price indices have been declining consistently in 2011, but there has been some reversal of this trend in January and February. Nevertheless, Global food prices remain well below the levels reached in the first few months of 2011. The impact of these developments on domestic prices will also depend on the rand exchange rate and local harvests. There has been some moderation in domestic grain price increases in recent months, following sharp increases in maize prices in the second half of 2011. We therefore could see a further moderation in food price inflation in the coming months, but the longer term outlook is uncertain. The MPC is of the view that while the main pressures on inflation are of a cost push nature, there is some evidence that these pressures may, become, may be becoming more broad based. However, these developments are in line with our previous forecasts and are expected to remain contained by the relatively subdued state of the domestic economy. Although at this stage the committee assesses the risks to the inflation outlook to be fairly evenly balanced, greater vigilance will be required going forward. The main upside risk to inflation is seen to emanate from global oil prices, and while food price inflation is expected to moderate in the short run, the longer term risks remain. The exchange rate is, as always, highly uncertain, but the risk posed to inflation in recent months has subsided somewhat, given the less volatile, albeit uncertain, global environment. Domestic economic growth is expected to remain below potential. In light of this and the expected medium-term inflation trajectory, the committee is of the view that at this stage the current stance of monetary policy is appropriate to support the real economy, while at the same time maintaining its commitment to achieve the inflation target over the medium term. The Monetary Policy Committee has therefore decided to keep the repo rate unchanged at 5.5% per annum. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's open to questions, comments. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you again to identify yourselves and colleagues, as always? Um, please, I will refer some questions to you as, uh, as they arise. Mary? Thank you, Governor. Mary Misa from Business Day. Um, your statement says the slightly improved inflation trajectory is mainly a result of a less depreciated exchange rate assumption. Does this mean that your assumption for the exchange rate going forward is still for some depreciation? Um, I think the question about the exchange rate really is one that it largely depends on what is happening globally. 
So the, the, the one uncertain factor is what will happen with the exchange rate. So the assumption at this point in time is, as we've said, for slightly depreciated, but it depends on what occurs. Um, in the longer term, in the medium to longer term, the reasons for the capital flows into emerging markets have not gone away, and that will impact on exchange rates of emerging markets, including South Africa. So it is an uncertain quantum, but one that obviously impacts, and we watch very closely. Anyone else? <laughs> Let me see first, Mary. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> Franz Wild from Bloomberg. Uh, Governor, you, you say or, um, that there's some evidence that uh, pressures on inflation may be becoming more broad-based, which I think is in, in line with what you said a few weeks ago about inflation possibly becoming more generalized. Can you elaborate on what exactly points to this and what is, what is driving that? Well, if you look at the numbers that affect education, healthcare, um, there's quite a lot of areas in which inflation, as we mentioned, your question of labor, all of these are above the inflation levels. And that, as we've seen before, it is not necessarily, um, if we looked at inflation minus what we would call your electricity, your electricity petrol and, and food, you are seeing the upward trajectory. It's not new. We have raised this on a number of occasions, and as I've said in this statement, that we had expected that uh, core inflation would peak at slightly higher than what we have in this statement. So what we are saying is that you can see it's moved from below 4% to 4.3, and there is an upward trajectory, and we will watch that closely. Um, so that there is a question of rising inflation in other components than the food, electricity, and petrol, as we've said. So it does, in our view, indicate that it is slightly more broad-based. We do not see it running away. We don't see it escalating very fast, but we're simply pointing to the fact that this is an important area that we need to watch quite closely, and we'll be doing so. You want to follow up? Um, yeah, just to follow up, I mean, has the latest inflation data in any way, obviously you've reiterated this, but has it in any way tempered, tempered your view and I mean, I see you have changed your inflation outlook. We have changed very marginally, as we've seen, and we think that this is something that is actually peaking earlier and coming back into the band slightly earlier. Um, but we, we're saying it's developing different components, uh, and it's simply a reiteration of what we've said before, is that core is rising as well, and, uh, but we are very firmly of the view that the primary drivers of inflation at this point in time remain cost push. Um, but we would be watching what is happening to poor. But as I said, it, it indicates that he's turning down slightly earlier. Um, but it is something that we feel that we need to draw attention to. Um, but it is within the context of that the main driver is cost push inflation. Good afternoon, Governor Nompumelelo Siziba from Summit TV. Just, I know you touched on the international oil price. Just to find out, how concerned are you about developments in that area, and have you got any forecasts as to where you see it going in the next few months? I think that it would be very brave if, for anyone to indicate where they think oil prices will go in the next few months. They are driven largely by uh, geopolitical risks, I think the statements by the Saudis are, are, is something that is very uh, worthwhile to watch and see what happens, where the Saudis have said they would be looking at oil supplies to look at an oil price around $100 a barrel, um, and that if they are able to succeed and other oil production comes on stream, you will see that the oil price should moderate. But I don't think that it, you know, we would be looking at it to say that that's what we would commit to. They're saying there are signs that it would that it is being taken seriously by significant oil producers, which should help moderate. But at this point in time, I think that there is a general forecast that oil prices are rising. What we have seen is that they are hovering around $125 a barrel, whereas a few months ago the expectation was that they would be significantly higher than that. So it is a very serious risk factor, not just for South Africa, but for 
uh, global economic developments because oil is a very uh, high driver of what can happen both to inflation and to growth. But I certainly wouldn't give a forecast for it. Governor, just um, to comment on the South African situation, obviously we're trying to um, find different, so get to, um, oil from different sources other than Iran. Uh, we rely on Iran for 25% of our oil, uh, crude oil imports. Um, and I hear that we might have to pay a premium for that. So that, that would be a double whammy, wouldn't it? Well, I would not go by what double whammies we may or may not have to pay. The reality is that there is a geopolitical risk taking place around Iran. There are sanctions being imposed, and it is a reality that, you know, the questions of insurance, shipping, and so on come into account as to whether you can even get oil from Iran. It is important for us that we do not have interruptions to oil supplies, and I think there's a general agreement that as you move to alternate supplies, um, that you would have to look at the refinery and the carrying through of that. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be that we have to pay up enormously. That will be something that we would have to look at and negotiate as part of oil supply generally. This isn't a South African issue only. There are many countries who have had oil uh, supplies from Iran. And that's why I said the question of the oil supply and the fact that you've got other countries, oh, the oil from Iran is very similar to the oil from Saudi. Um, and therefore would need some adjustment, and the Saudis have committed to increasing production. You've also got increasing production coming from elsewhere. So it is something that is a, a global challenge in relation to finding a peaceful solution to what is a very dangerous situation. And South Africa will deal with it accordingly in terms of what is in, in the best interest of finding solutions, including for our own economy. I don't know um, if you'd like to add anything to that. Yes, sir. Um, SABC News. Um, Governor, if, if we were to make an, 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 an assessment since uh, the, the bank adopted um, a commodative loose monetary policy, uh, would you say that perhaps um, the, 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 the monetary policy has indeed achieved its, uh, its, its, its objective? Um, just one question. And, and, and secondly is on the, the, the recent downgrade of S&P. Uh, was it discussed by the, by the committee in any way? Thanks. Um, whether monetary policy has achieved its goals. Um, and I'm not sure I would respond on the basis of this being a, having adopted accommodative loose monetary policy. We, accommodate, we, we adopt a monetary policy that we think is a suitable at this point in time, which, as you know, real interest rates are slightly negative. Uh, we think it is the appropriate policy for the time that we have, and we've held rates steady for a considerable period of time now. Have we achieved our goals? It depends which way you look at it. Um, I think that could be answered in a million ways. If somebody is an inflation target uh, purist, let's say you haven't because the inflation is outside the band. We have a flexible inflation target approach which says that we would bring it back into the band over time, which is the approach we're taking, and that we take account of the economic environment, both globally and domestically. So that, you know, as I've said before, we take account of what is happening, as we've said in the statement, what are the global risks, what is the outlook globally, what is its potential impact on South Africa, as well as what is happening domestically, what is happening to growth, employment, um, all of these factors come into account. So um, it is the, it's a hardly for us to, to say, oh, we think we've done well. I think it is for us to say we're doing what we think is appropriate in the circumstances, and um, it will be for others to judge whether we're doing that well. In terms of the S&P, uh, I think the Treasury has issued a statement, which we in full support of. Of course, the, the, the committee discussed it, because we think it's wholly inappropriate. And, uh, you know, just to look at some of the numbers, if you had to look at what the concerns of S&P are, I think it is a, an assessment of South Africa that does not necessarily understand and appreciate the dynamics. Uh, if we looked at South Africa's numbers compared to many numbers in the world, I think we're doing, you know, we've done very well as a country. So I think, uh, you know, the Treasury has responded and we would support that statement. Miriam? Um, thank you. In the closing sentence of the MPC statement, um, you, the MPC says that although the risk to the inflation outlook are evenly balanced, greater vigilance will be required going forward. I wondered, um, can we take this to imply that the NPC thinks um, 
there should be greater vigilance regarding um, a rising trend in inflation. Is the concern that the inflation outlook will skew to now to the upside? Um, my other question regards the comment at the beginning about a rigorous discussion. Um, did anyone discuss a rate hike um, in terms of its timing? No, there was no discussion about a rate hike at all, not in terms of timing or whether it should be uh, considered. In terms of the question of greater vigilance, what we are saying, and I think it's important that we all understand this, this um, approach, we are saying is that you, if we look at the world today, the one thing that you have is uncertainty. And while you think that it's improving, I mean, if you just looked at the statements over the last week yourselves, your analysts, your journalists, you're looking at this question, you'd have a view of what was happening in the United States where the numbers would say one thing and, and the statements around it are urging caution. Um, in the Eurozone, you're far from out of the problem. If you looked at emerging Europe, far from out of the problem. And therefore, we can't be complacent we cannot in any way afford to be complacent about the outlook for South Africa because we are in many ways affected by what occurs in these economies. Um, U.S. is affected by growth in the Eurozone. If you're having a recession in the Eurozone, which there is for this year, um, if you looked at some of the effects on Greece, Greece has contracted by unbelievable amounts. If you look at the unemployment, you're no longer simply dealing with a question of a sovereign debt issue and a banking sector problem. You now have a consequence to what has been in the mix of very, very serious unemployment. Um, so all of these factors influence and impact on us, and therefore we're saying it's appropriate to what the position we're taking is appropriate for the current outlook on the economy. But should things change, which they are very likely to, there's a great deal of uncertainty in the world, then we must be rigorous and prepared to act accordingly, which we are. So therefore, we maintain our commitment to support the economy, which we think we're doing. And I want to re-emphasize that the question of holding rates steady is not a default position. It's an active decision. You have three decisions, raise, hold, or lower. And we exercise a decision about holding. It's not something, oh, we, we're not quite sure about A or B, so let's, let's go to, to a default position. It is not that at all. It's a very rigorous discussion about what we see. And I think that's the difference. We're not sitting here arguing with each other about different viewpoints. We're trying to analyze and understand what are we seeing and what are the implications of that, and implications for whom and at what level and in what timeline. At the best of times, central banks deal with uncertainty. In these times, you deal, with, you deal with uncertainty compounded. Yes. Kifilo Mulifi from the UNISA Radio. Um, Governor, uh, in your statement, you say that the pharma sector will have to grow uh, by a further 131,000 to reach the levels achieved in 2008 before the crisis. How measurable is uh, this uh, statement? Sorry, just, I didn't hear you properly. How measurable is your your outlook for the 131,000 oh, jobs, jobs target, yes. I'm going to ask Rashad if you'd like to talk to that um, and perhaps elaborate on that. Thank you. It's pretty straightforward. What we're saying is that this is the, the number you had uh, before the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, it, during the crisis, you lost, I think, in the formal sector in the QS, a couple of hundred thousand, not quite as big as the entire population, which was both the formal and informal. So when we say that you need 131,000 to reach pre-crisis level. That was what the total level of employment uh, in the court, uh, uh, in the economy was before the contraction in the economy. So it's a fairly straightforward deduction from what total level employment was before the contraction and what it, what it should be to have the same level of employment now. Okay. Okay. I just also perhaps, uh, okay, go ahead. Sorry, Governor. Usually in the inflation expectations, you also refer to what unions are expecting. So I wonder, do you have that information as to what their expectations are? And do you think it's realistic of um, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon uh, to want to cap wage increases for the public sector at 5%? I think the latter question you'll have to ask the Minister. Um, I think that's a debate between the government, not ourselves. 
in terms of union expectations, certainly um, we have them, but I think that in terms of expectations, we need to recognize that if we, as a central bank, we have inflation at 6.1, and we have a, an inflation expectation, on, and what we're seeing is our trajectory is above 6%. You, I think that for, for inflation expectations to be anchored or to be hovering around the 6% is totally realistic. You can't ask them to be much lower than what the actual inflation is or what your own projections are. But I'm not sure if you've got the, the numbers for um, the unions. It was between the business and... Um, I, I can't remember them exactly offhand, but they were slightly above 6%, but below the business uh, executives who were at 65 Okay, but we can, if you want the detail, give it to you. That's not a, a problem. Anyone else? Let me just see if I'm missing anyone else, Miriam. No, please go ahead. Um, just one more question. Given that South Africa is so affected by the global environment, um, what are the chances of, do you think there is of the U.S. embarking on a round of QE3, which would definitely affect the RAND and other emerging market currencies? I think that Ben Bernanke has spoken quite extensively over the last couple of days, and I think it's up to him to answer on the question of further QE. What he has clearly stated is that he has concerns, and he has uh, data that is puzzling. But what he plans to do about it, I think that really is up to him. Can I just follow up? I mean, if it does happen, what do you think the effect will be on the RAND? Don't you think the RAND might strengthen as it has in the past? I think there would be a number of factors that affect the RAND. I don't think it would only be about QE3 or two and a half or whatever is done. And as I said earlier, the question around the search for yield, if you're looking at what the reasons for flows into emerging markets, which really is yield around what meeting obligations and liabilities, uh, I think that those reasons have not gone away. And therefore, you are seeing flows or are likely to see flows into emerging markets. And this will be a fairly volatile um, happening because if you look at it, every time something else happens, there's a flight to quality, if you can say that about the dollar at the moment. Uh, familiarity is probably more the issue. And, and therefore, you have these swings, and that will continue for some time. You really do need resolution of Europe before you're going to get stability in your outlook and be able to take longer-term views. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, don't forget the European as an export market for the U.S. is huge as well. So what happens in Europe matters. And um, there's certainly a less a, a sense of improvement, but the underlying problems have not been addressed. And therefore, the outlook for Europe is one of recession this year and a very difficult way forward. Certainly, the steps taken by the ECB have created space. It's now whether that space is used appropriately. And as I said, one of the challenges that you've got is the question of rising unemployment, um, especially among youth uh, in Europe, and the role that that is going to play in resolution, because it has to play a role. Any other questions? Is there somebody there with a hand? No? Anyone else? If I could then say, first of all, thank you, but I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Bertus van Zeel. Bertus has been a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, I think, since its inception, Bertus, yeah, which must be, what, 99? 99. 99. Bertus is coming up for retirement, and therefore this is his last Monetary Policy Committee meeting. He has been an invaluable member, contributed thoughtfully, rigorously, and uh, we would want to just take this opportunity with all of you to thank him for the work that's done. It's not his farewell from the bank, but it is his last Monetary uh, Policy Committee meeting. And we want to just take the opportunity to wish you well and thank you. And again, to everybody else, thank you very much for coming through today for your questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing you in May. It must be May. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>